Good afternoon, online family. It's your boy, JR, back again with yet another teaching. And today we are talking about the role of the teacher uh, in the five gifts mentioned in Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verses 11. You know, it talks about the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor. But today we're talking about the teacher to conclude uh, this five gift teaching, you know, that God gave the church, Christ gave the church. And so uh, to start... We're going to talk about uh, what is a teacher in the body of Christ. Uh, teachers are interpreters of the word of God. So when you're talking about within the context of scripture, uh, that being the Bible, teachers within the context of scripture, they are interpreters of the word of God. What does that mean? Um, they are those who break down the scriptures and give understanding of the scriptures to those who lack the understanding or the interpretation of the scriptures uh, that is what they do uh to give you an example like i like to do if i don't speak spanish um someone who is speaking spanish to me i won't understand what they're talking about so now someone who is a translator or they represent an interpreter they are the person who is going to receive all that this other individual is saying to me and then they're going to interpret it to me in a way that I can understand what this other individual just said. So when you think about the Bible or the scripture, however you, you like to say that, it is a spiritual book because God is spirit, says John chapter 4, verses 24. God is the spirit. So that means the, the, the scripture, it's a spiritual book, which means only one who is given the gift by God to teach will be able to actually understand the, the 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 word of God and then they can now give understanding based on the understanding God has given them to others so teachers are interpreters of the word of God in scripture uh, their job in the body of Christ is to break down the scripture and give understanding for those who are new in the body or those who simply just lack understanding of the word due to bad leadership so what do I mean by that is there are some people who have been quote unquote Christians for five years, 10 years, but yet they don't know anything about the Bible. They don't, they, they don't understand scripture. They can't quote scripture. Um, and you say, why is that? Well, a lot of times that's because the foundation of how they came to Christ was all, you know, wrong from the beginning. Um, and the reality, there's a way, this is why I'm teaching the, the fivefold ministry, the apostle, evangelist, a pastor, I mean, a, a past, a pro, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. This is the reason we're doing this teaching because there's a system that Christ gave. And when we go away from the system, the reality is sometimes we have people who receive the gospel message of Jesus Christ, but then uh, they don't go, they're not given more than just the gospel message. And the problem is if you only know that Jesus Christ is your savior, and if you give your life to him, you'll be saved and that's all you're given, but you're not given discipleship. Then the problem is, you know, that contradicts, you know, what Christ himself, you know, taught the apostles because in the great commission, which we think sometimes is something that Jesus was speaking to, the, to everybody, but he was specifically speaking to his 11 uh, apostles at that time in Matthew 28 verses 16 to 20 he commissioned them not only to go and and, and preach the gospel but uh he tells them to to make disciples you know of, of all the nations and you're going to see this again and I'll read it Matthew 28 starting at 16 then the 11 disciples left for Galilee going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go when they saw him they worshiped him but some of them doubted Jesus came and told his disciples I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So one of the things that Jesus told them, you know, his, his, his 11 apostles was not to just go and baptize these new believers, you know, and preach to them the gospel message of Jesus Christ, but it was also to disciple them. That's why you, when you go to Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, Peter preaches 3,000 people who heard his message, they believe. But then immediately when you go into, into uh, Acts chapter 2, you know, when you go into uh, verses 41 and, 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 and counting, you're going to see that it says that the believers, these new believers devoted themselves to the apostles teaching because now they had become disciples of the apostles. So the reality is um, a lot of times to get back in point, sometimes people uh, lack an understanding of the word, even though they've been Christians for five to 20 years because their foundation was wrong. They might have gotten the gospel message of Jesus Christ, but they were never 
discipled. Without discipleship, you will not grow in uh, maturity uh, spiritually. Without discipleship, you won't grow in your understanding of the word. Because if I have a newborn baby and I expect him or her to learn how to tie their shoe by themselves, if I expect him or her to learn how to put a, a spoon in, in, in the cereal and, and put it to their mouth, the reality is as that child gets to be 20 years of age, if they never were discipled by dad or by mom, the reality is though their age says 20 years old, their behavior will still say, zero years old. Their behavior will still say one years old, though, because they weren't discipled, they weren't taught. So teachers, they interpret uh, the, the the scriptures. Um, and I want to give some definitions for the word teacher uh, in Hebrew and in Greek. As you know, uh, I always, always refer, uh, recommend a strong concordance book. Reason being, the Bible was originally written first primarily in Hebrew. Secondly, in Greek, and so when you translate the Bible into a new language, sometimes words can take on new meanings in different languages. So when you break a word down in its original language that the book was written in, you're able to get, you know, um, the, the word at its purest form or in, in its purest form. So in Hebrew, there's two definitions for this word, and in Greek, there's one. The two words in Hebrew, one being bin, the other being yara. Bin means to understand or to discern. Uh, yara means to teach, which hence the word teacher, you find the word teach in that word. And in Greek, uh, it means didaskalos, which means instructor. And an instructor actually translates to the word doctrine. And in the word doctrine, you or in the word doctrinate, you find the word doctrine. So an instructor is someone who is indoctrinating uh, somebody with whatever it is they're instructing you about. So if I'm in, if I'm instructing you on the scriptures, then I'm indoctrinating you with the scriptures. Um, so typically, I mean, in conclusion, a teacher is someone who understands the scriptures and then they can teach it or indoctrinate others with the understanding of this that God has given them. And that is who a teacher is in the body. Uh, I'm giving you a lot of words. I don't like to give too much words, but I'm trying to give you as much as possible that you would be able to understand and, and conclusion what a teacher is in the Bible. So now to get into point number three, uh, in the body of Christ, who are teachers? So one of the things I want to emphasize is there is something called dual gifts or a, 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 tr a, tr a trio calling, I guess. It's not a term you'll find in scripture, but when I say trio, it means three. When I say dual, it means two. And what I mean by that is you're going to see that some people may be gifted in multiple areas. For example, to give you an example of this, we're going to go to 2 Timothy chapter chapter, chapter 1, verses 11 to 14. Um, so I can make you understand what I mean by that when I say like someone can have a dual calling or they can have a, a, a uh, they can have a triune calling or trio calling, however you want to say that. Um, so in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 11 to 14, this is the Apostle Paul talking and he's going to say, in this particular piece of scripture to Timothy, I'm in 2 Corinthians, forgive me. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses <clears throat> 11 to 14, Paul says, And God chose me to be a preacher, which is an evangelist, an apostle, which is a witness of Christ, and a teacher of this good news. So Paul was an evangelist, he was an apostle, and he was a teacher. Again, he was a preacher, which is an evangelist, he was an apostle, and he was a teacher. So what I mean when I say dual calling, or uh, trio calling, or triune calling, however you want to say that, three callings in one person, um, that simply means that this individual has more than one gift. And what I've come to discover in scripture is teachers in the New Testament were not just people who were teachers. Teachers were always in scripture in the New Testament. They were people who had dual callings, meaning they were either apostles slash teachers or they were pastors slash teachers or 
They could be an evangelist slash teacher, but the reality is the teacher in the New Testament isn't someone who's just a teacher. You know, I don't see it in scripture. I see uh, when I study it in the New Testament that everyone who operated as teachers, they had dual callings and teaching was a uh, was one of the gifts. So I don't believe the teaching gift, and this is my biblical opinion in scripture. Like I said, you can study it for yourself in the New Testament from Matthew to Revelation. I don't believe that the teacher is a is a gift that is solo. I don't believe that because I don't see that. Um, and I'm going to give you scriptures to, to prove what I'm saying to you, that the teacher is typically going to be connected to the apostle the uh, the 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 pastor or the evangelist i'll repeat that the teacher is going to be connected to the apostle or the pastor or the evangelist those three gifts operate as teachers apostles if you're an apostle you're going to be a teacher as well uh that's a that's a you can sandwich that together an apostle automatically you will be a teacher as well a pastor automatically you'll be a teacher as well if you're evangelist, you you may not operate primarily as a teacher, but you must be able to teach. And I'm going to show you why I say that with scripture. So teachers in the body of Christ are typically going to be uh, apostles, pastors, and sometimes can be an evangelist, though primarily it typically won't be an evangelist because evangelists, they're typically going to just preach. But sometimes it can be necessary for them to teach if the moment asked them, if the situation asked for that. But primarily what I've seen in the scriptures in the New Testament primarily is the teacher, the, the teaching gift goes with the apostle and the pastor. So let's put some scripture to this so that way it's not just me teaching my opinion, but I'm giving you scripture to, to validate or back up what it is that I'm teaching you now. So I said to you, teachers typically are not a, a solo band gift. It's a gift that is attached to the apostle or the pastor. And uh, let me tell you, let me show you why I say that. So we're going to start uh, apostles or teachers. We're going to show you the, a plethora of scriptures starting in the book of Mark. You know, we're going to go to the the four gospels because I always say, as I've said in uh, many of my other videos, is Jesus was a manifestation of all the gifts. Jesus was a apostle because he was sent to us by God. You know, the scriptures tell us that he was sent his father. He was sent by his father. An apostle is uh, is one that is sent. Now, when you talk about the apostles of the Lamb, you know, those are commissioners of Christ, people who were sent out. And you see that the original 12 apostles in Matthew 10 were sent out. In Matthew 28, they were sent out. But Jesus, who is the chief apostle, he was sent to earth by his father. That makes him an apostle. Um, when you think about Jesus and the rulers of prophet, a prophet speaks the future. Jesus, if you study him in the four gospels, he predicted the future. He predicted many things that would happen. Matthew 24, you think Luke 22, when he tells Peter is going to deny him. You know, uh, there's a plethora of scriptures where Jesus prophesies, you know, he tells his disciples that he's going to be, you know, uh, killed, you know, handed to the hand of the, the he's going to be handed to the le religious leaders and he's going to be killed and he'll raise on the third day. Again, he prophesied he was a prophet. Um, you think about an evangelist. Jesus did not stay in one place while he was here on earth. He went to different towns and he preached the gospel message, repent of your sins and turn to, to God. Um, so he was an evangelist. You think about Jesus was a uh, a pastor because he shepherded the twelve. He you know he was their shepherd. You know they were his sheep. You know when in John chapter six when Jesus says that you have to eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. You know and many of his disciples desert him. Uh, he looks at the twelve and he asks them, Are you going to leave as well? And 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 it's Peter who steps up and he says, Where would we go? Uh, you have the words that give eternal life because they understood he was our he was their shepherd. This is why Jesus, when he talks about, you know, the good shepherd in, in John chapter 10, he says, the, he says in John chapter 10, he says, I am the good shepherd. And he says that, you know, he sacrifices his life for the sheep. One of the things that he says in that, in that um, soliloquy, he says that the sheep know his voice, you know, they, they recognize his voice. That's in John 10, 3. He says the gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep recognize his voice and come to him. So you see when Jesus said that, you know, you have to eat of my blood and, 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 and I mean, eat of my flesh and drink of my blood to be to be my disciples. You know, though many people deserted him because of those words he spoke, the, the 12, they didn't desert him because they recognized the voice of their shepherd because a pastor is a shepherd. Jesus had been with them. There was many things he had said. There were many things that he had done and they recognized him as their shepherd. So he was also a pastor in that role. 
Um, and now to get to Jesus as a teacher, uh, I'm going to show you this in the book of Mark, chapter 1. Mark, chapter 1. We're going to see Jesus in the, in the role of a teacher here. Mark, chapter 1, and we will start at verses 21. Jesus and his companions went down, went to the town of Capernaum. When the Sabbath day came, look at this, he went into the synagogue and began to teach. He went into the synagogue and began to teach. This is Jesus. And it goes on to say, the people were amazed at his what? At his teaching, for he taught with real authority, quite unlike the teachers of religious law. Suddenly a man in the synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit began shouting, why are you interfering with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Jesus cut him short. Be quiet. Come out of the man, he ordered. At that, the evil spirit screamed, threw the man into a convulsion, and then came out of him. Amazement gripped the audience, and they began to discuss what happened. Look at what they say. What sort of new teaching is this? They, they asked excitedly. It has such authority. Even evil spirits obey his orders. The news about Jesus spread quickly throughout the entire region of Galilee. So you see that Jesus, again, uh, he was teaching in the synagogue when an uh, evil spirit confronted him and he, 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 he commanded the spirit to come out. Uh, you're going to see when Jesus is going to be taken away, you know, uh, in the end of his ministry, when the religious leaders come, came to get him, he questions them and says, why didn't you you know, come get me when I was teaching, you know, he says this in, um, this is in Luke chapter 21. Uh, I'm going to read verses 37. Um, it goes on to say, every day Jesus went to the temple to teach and each evening he returned to spend the night on the Mount of Olives. That tells you there he was a teacher was there, but that was not the one that I wanted. I wanted it when they came to, to arrest him. You're going to see what Jesus says. Um, Yeah, he tells them, he tells the religious guards when they came to arrest him. This is in Luke 22, verses um, 53. He says, why didn't you arrest me in the temple? I was there every day, you know, uh, but this is your moment, the time when the power of darkness reigned. So he was in the temple every day. But what we found out in Luke 21, verses 37, what was he doing in the temple every day? It told us in Luke 21, 37, it says every day Jesus went to the temple to teach. So you see, he, but he told the religious leaders when they came to arrest him, why didn't you arrest me? When he, he says, why didn't you arrest me in the temple? What was he doing in the temple every day? Luke 21, 37 just told you he was teaching. So Jesus was in fact also a teacher. So I say all that to say what? Uh, what was he teaching? He was teaching about heaven. He was teaching about the mysteries of the kingdom. You know, when you go to, to uh, Matthew chapter 5, you know, when Jesus has his disciples, you know, and he's teaching them. Look, we're going to see the teachings that he's given them. It's, it's new gems, new truths, you know, things they hadn't, you know, heard before. So you're going to see in Matthew 5, again, this is just Jesus in the role of a teacher. Uh, it says, one day as he saw the crowds gathering, Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples gathered around him and he began to teach them and began to teach them so what was he just teaching them he was thinking he was teaching them things of above so look at what he begins to teach them in the beatitudes and if you want to read about the beatitudes you know basically read all of matthew 5 read all of matthew chapter 6 read all of matthew chapter 7 jesus is just he's his teaching is it's it's, it's it's plenty you know plentiful and he and, but just to give you a, some of it he says god blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him for the kingdom of heaven is theirs God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you when people mock and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember that the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. So again, what is the teacher's job when you talk about the teacher of the word of God, the teacher of the scriptures? They are here to give you understanding of spiritual things. God, 
Now you, we're going to go. We're going to go. We're going to go. <laughs> we're going to go. We're going to start cooking. Holy Spirit speak. A teacher of God, they are here to give you understanding of spiritual things. The Bible tells you in John chapter 4, verses 24, that God is spirit. So to understand spiritual things, to understand when God speaks, what it means, that's where teachers come in. You know, teachers are the interpreters of spiritual things. Teachers must have the Holy Spirit. I want to emphasize this because uh, you cannot be a teacher of the book. You cannot be a teacher in the body of Christ if you are not in fact in the body of Christ. You know, this is one of the problems I have with Bible college. You know, I'm going to be blunt about this. A lot of Bible colleges, the problem is you have people who are not filled with the Holy Spirit up their teaching. What are they teaching? You can't teach or be a teacher of the lamb you can't be a teacher in the body of Christ if you don't if you're not part of the body of Christ you have people at bible colleges who are quote unquote teachers but they'll tell you they don't even believe in God they will tell you you know they don't believe in the holy spirit they don't they don't believe in certain things like this in fact you know if you listen to some of these teachers teach or speak you can discern if you have the gift of discernment that they're not spirit filled because the things that they teach contradict the bible and the reality is to be a teacher of the lamb, you must have the spirit of the lamb. First and foremost, I want to emphasize that because you're going to see Jesus in his three-year ministry with the disciples. He's teaching them, he's teaching them, he's teaching them. But they, even them at the time, because they did not have the Holy Spirit, there's certain things that they, they, that Jesus was teaching. They didn't fully, they couldn't really understand. It was too much for them to understand. And then it's going to say, Jesus is going to tell his disciples in John chapter 14, verses 26. Um, well, I'll start at 23 for a little bit of context. He says, it says, Jesus replied, all who love me will do what I say. My father will love them and we will come and make our home with each of them. Anyone who doesn't love me will not obey me. And remember that, and remember my words are not my own. What I am telling you is from the father who sent me. I, I am telling you these things now while I'm still with you. Look at this. Verse 26 is our anchor verse. But when the father sends the advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you. So the Holy Spirit was going to teach the disciples who would become the apostles of the Lamb, who would be the leaders of the first church. The Holy Spirit was going to teach them everything. And furthermore, he was going to remind them of everything that Jesus had told them. So the reality is one of the key points is to be a teacher, you know, in the body of Christ, you have to have the Holy Spirit. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you automatically cannot be a teacher un until you are in the body. Like Paul, you know, I read to you that in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 11 and 14, he, he was chosen by God to be a teacher, to be an apostle, to be an evangelist. But notice this, he was not a teacher of the Lamb until he received the Holy Spirit, you know, in Acts chapter 9, you know, when he has a, he's on the road to Damascus, you know, and he has an encounter with Jesus. And then after that encounter, Jesus speaks to Ananias in a vision and tells him to go to Straight Street to lay his hands on Ananias that he would be able to receive the Holy Ghost. And, be, and then he was baptized. And then immediately after that, Paul began to evangelize. He began to preach the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Paul began to teach with accuracy with Barnabas the word of God. But when do we see Paul operating as the, in, in this gift? After he received the Holy Ghost, meaning if you don't have the Holy Ghost, you're not qualified to, to, to talk about spiritual, to teach at least spirit. You can, you're free to talk about anything you want. Forgive me for saying that, but you're not qualified to, to teach other believers, you know, about spiritual things. Um, and, and so teachers are those who teach this, the scriptures, they, they interpret spiritual things. And now to bring it back in point, because I was talking about how apostles are teachers, uh, I said to you that Jesus, who was the chief apostle, we see him, he was a teacher as well. And and why, you know, the teaching gift is going to be attached to the apostle primarily first is because um, apostles, they come embodying uh, a new move of God in an area that is spiritually dead. This is why, as you saw I, when I read it in Mark chapter 1, when Jesus began to, when he was teaching in the synagogue, a demon and a man recognized who Jesus was and the demon manifest through the individual that it was in. 
And then Jesus, you know, he rebukes the demon, casts the demon out of the person. And then look at in verse 27, it says that there was amazement that gripped the audience and they begin to discuss what happened. And then one of the things they begin to say amongst themselves was what sort of new teaching is this? They asked excitedly. They said it has such authority. Even evil spirits obey his orders. And furthermore, if you go to Matthew 7, you're going to see the, 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 that there's a, a similar um, uh uh, a similar uh, wording uh, that is said, the crowd, is, I mean, there's a, a similarity to the, what this crowd are saying versus what the crowd just said in Mark chapter 1, verses 21 to uh, 28. So in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus is going to be teaching. And now look at this. This is Matthew 7, 20, starting at 24. Jesus says, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the flood waters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. For he taught with real authority, quite unlike the teachers of religious law. You see the difference? Jesus taught with real authority. And this is quite unlike the, the teachers of religious law. Because the, te the teachers of religious law, they were Pharisees. They were people who were not spirit-filled. And this is what I said. Like you find in a lot of Bible colleges is you have a lot of people who are not spirit-filled. And then they teach and they have there's no conviction to their teaching. There's no boldness to their teaching. There's a lack of accuracy to their teaching. There's a lack of, of discernment in their teaching. You know, uh, there's, a, there's a lack of seasoning in their teaching. But the one that is spirit-filled... You know, because they're spirit filled, the spirit operates through them. And when they teach, there's an accuracy to their teaching. When they teach, your eyes are open. The veil is, is removed from your eyes. The veil in your mind is, is, is let down because of the teaching of the true man of God. You're going to see Jesus, who was the son of God. He shows up and his teaching has such authority that even demons, you know, begin to manifest at his teaching. The reality is Jesus was an apostle. And I'm trying to show you that the apostle, they are teachers. They are teachers. Because an apostle is someone that is sent to a territory that is bound. It is bound. It's a territory that is bound. It is under demonic possession. It is a territory where the people are in, you know, they're, they're under the stronghold of the enemy. And so how is God going to dispatch an apostle in a territory to set that territory free? Oh, it starts with truth. Because in John chapter 8, uh, Jesus is going to say that the truth shall set you free. Uh, this is in John chapter 8, starting at verses 31. It says, Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain, look at this, if you remain faithful to my teachings. Why is the teachings, a, 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 a t the teacher connected to the apostle? Because an apostle is someone who God dispatches in the, in, into a territory that is bound, you know, by demons. It's bound by the devil. And 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 what the how does the devil bound you? The devil bounds you by put it by, 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 by keeping you in confusion. The devil bounds you by, by wrapping you with lies. You see, when you're wrapped with lies and you don't know truth, you will always be bound. If I keep telling you, Hey, if you want to be rich, keep putting, you know, money in, in my bank account every week. If you don't know anything and you keep doing that, but then years keep going by and you're like, yo, I'm broke, I'm broke. But you keep coming to me and I keep telling you the same thing. Yeah, just, just keep putting your money in my bank account every week. And as long as you do that, you're going to be rich. Well, that's a lie. But unless someone else comes and tells you the truth and you keep depositing your money in my bank account, you're going to always be broke because you see, there's a lie that I'm telling you that until you hear the truth, you're going to always be bound, meaning financially, you're going to be bound. You're going to be broke. So what does that mean? The reality is the truth is what sets people free. So the apostle is someone that God dispatches in an area, right? He sends the apostle out like he did with his son, Jesus Christ. He sent him to earth and, and Jesus came from God to earth and he was embodying a message of repentance. He was embodying teachings that begin to make people go, oh my goodness, I never, I never noticed that. Oh my goodness. My goodness, you're teaching stuff that I've never heard. And, and through teaching from the apostle, people begin to get set free. So I'm going to go further more after this. I talk about how pastors are teachers as well as evangelists. But right now we're focusing on how teachers are connected to the apostle, the, the apostle gift. They're connected. An apostle, if you're an apostle and you can't teach, you 
to me, you're not an apostle. Biblically speaking, you can't be an apostle because an apostle is an equipper of equippers, meaning uh, a pastors are supposed to come from, you know, their they're, pastors are supposed to be birthed, you know, from uh, the the the. Uh, apostolic doctrine you know uh same thing with evangelists uh prophets and teachers so the reality is if an apostle isn't able to teach you're not an apostle that's probably one of the ways i can discern if you're a false apostle is you don't know how to teach your, your, your teaching is not accurate your teaching does not align with the teaching of the original apostles which their teaching came from jesus but my point though is jesus is going to tell these people you know if you remain faithful to my teachings uh you're my true disciples. And he says that you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So apostles are teachers and Jesus was the first apostle. But we're going to see if what I'm saying is true, then we should be able to see that what I'm saying, it aligns because, OK, if Jesus was an apostle and he was a teacher. Then that means the other apostles in scriptures, we have to see where they teach us as well. And in fact, they were. And we're going to show you this with scripture to show you this. So I showed you some some some, some stuff of Jesus, and now I'm going to show you the other apostles. So we're going to start first in Acts chapter 2. So on the day of Pentecost, we know that Peter preached the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Uh, this is, you'll find this all in Acts chapter 2. Read the entire chapter. Um, and at the end of that soliloquy in verses 41, those who believed in Peter's message, they were baptized and added to the church that day, about 3,000 and all. Peter was an apostle. We know that. Now we're going to go to verses 42 because I said to you, Jesus was an apostle. And I'm telling you that uh, the teaching gift is attached to the apostle. It's attached to the pastor. Then that means the people that were apostles in the scriptures, we need to see that they were all teachers as well. Not just Jesus, because if the fact is a fact, then that fact should be proven with the other apostles. And, and so we see it was proven with Jesus. He was an apostle who was a teacher. And now we're going to take you to the original 12 who were apostles as well as teachers. So in verses 42 of Acts chapter 2, it says that all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals and to prayer. All the believers devoted themselves to what? To the apostles teaching because the apostles were indoctrinating these new believers with the teaching that Christ had given to them. This is why in Matthew chapter 28, my God, you're going to see Jesus. And I say this all the time that people, sometimes they misinterpret Matthew 28 verses 16 to 20. They, they take the great commission and they, they, they apply the great commission to everybody that is in Christ. Granted, is everyone in the body of Christ supposed to do the work of ministry? Yes, but you cannot apply the great commission to everybody because Jesus was specifically speaking to his 11 disciples and he's going to tell his 11 disciples in, in Matthew 28 verses 20. He says to them, there, or starting at 19, therefore go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples. He tells the apostles, the 11 apostles, teach these new disciples, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands. Look at this. I have given you. Teach them to obey all the commands I have given you because the teachings of the apostles were the teachings that Jesus gave to them. And then after he gave it to them, they taught it to those that God had sent under them, you know, to, to, to be under their leadership. And so you're going to see that these apostles, again, in, 40, in Acts 2.42, they were teachers because the, uh, the, the new believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And to show you that um, they were teachers as well, you're going to find this in different parts of Scripture. Um, you're going to go, if we go to Acts the 6, we'll start at verses 1 to 4. You're going to see that it says this, um, but as the believers rapidly multiplied, there were rumblings of discontent. The Greek-speaking believers complained about the Hebrew-speaking believers, saying that their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve called the meeting of all the believers, the twelve apostles, that is. They said, we apostles, look what they're going to say. We apostles, we apostles should spend our time teaching the word of God, not running a food program. And so brothers, select seven men who are well-respected and are full of the spirit and wisdom. We will give them this responsibility. Then we apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching the word of God. Acts chapter 6 verses 1 to 4, fact check me. So the reality is apostles are teachers. Apostles, this is why I, I will say this, that apostles, the calling on apostles' life is great because um, they operate in uh, 
definitely more than a dual calling because they're not only sent, not only do they operate also as preachers of the gospel, because when they're sent, that's going to be the basis that they start with. They're going to be sent somewhere. They're going to preach the gospel message of Jesus Christ with power. And now that will be something that attracts people to them because not only are they preaching a new message in this area that hasn't been preached before, but through preaching, they're going to demonstrate power. That's what's going to separate them from the different religions because every religion is preaching something. Every religion has something they're saying, but what separates the the, 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 the ministry, you know, of Jesus Christ on earth from other religions is that our religion is not supposed to be just words. So an apostle doesn't just show up. He's not just sent by God to a specific region or location, but he's sent there with a message that Jesus Christ is Lord. And through this message that he's proclaiming, he demonstrates the power, you know, you know, of Jesus through the Holy Spirit within him and through demonstrating power with this message that he's proclaiming, people will be attracted to this individual to see, oh my goodness, okay, just like they were with Jesus, he showed up, he began to proclaim something they hadn't heard, he began to teach things, but he did it with power, so people were drawn to him, and then when they were drawn to him, he began to disciple them, and it's the same thing you're going to see, because when Jesus went to Peter, you know, Peter was drawn to him, because, you know, when he saw the power that Jesus manifested by this miracle of the fish that he caught, he was drawn to follow this guy. So an apostle typically is going to be someone that God is going to send somewhere. And when he sends the apostle to this to this place, he's going to proclaim a message. And, and he's not going to just proclaim with words. He's going to have power. And through the power invested in him by God, people will be drawn to him. And when they're drawn to him, just like on the day of Pentecost, these believers or these people, these other Jews in the, in the area, they were drawn because of the sign. And when they got there, the apostle Peter preached a message that was so powerful. The people were drawn now to Peter and the other apostles. And then what did they immediately do? They did what Jesus told them to do in Matthew 28. They discipled them. And discipleship is teaching. That's because When you think about a disciple, a disciple is a student. So these new believers became students. When you're a student, when you when you were a student in high school, when you were a student in college, when you were a student in elementary school, what did you have in your class? A teacher. Oh my God. So you're going to see that the apostles, you know, they operate in a little bit of everything. You know, they do a little bit of everything. But one of the primary things they do is they teach. So the teaching gift is connected with the apostle primarily. Um, because like I said, they are the ones that indoctrinate the new congregants. They indoctrinate this city, they, the city that God has placed them in. They, they, they are going to be people that, you know, they will indoctrinate these new disciples that, that God places under their care. Um, and that is one thing we see there. We're going to, I gave you scripture. Like I said, Matthew 28, 16 to 20, Jesus was speaking to his 11. You know, this was before Matthias you know, would have been uh, a part of them. You know, he was he was speaking to them. And um, you're going to see in Acts chapter 6, verse 1 to 4, the apostles talked about how they needed to spend their time, you know, in prayer and teaching the word of God. Um, you're going to see with Jesus in Mark chapter 1, who was an apostle who showed up on the scene and his teaching was powerful. Matthew 7, again, Jesus is an apostle, but he was also teaching. His teaching was powerful. Um, so you're going to see the teaching gift was, uh, it's connected to the apostle and we're going to go even further because like I said, Paul, who was also an apostle, you're going to see it's symmetrical with even Paul and Barnabas. When you go to Acts chapter 17 verses 10 to 12, Acts chapter 17 verses 10 to 12, what does it say? It says that very night, the believers sent Paul and Silas to Berea. When they arrived there, they went to the Jewish synagogue and the people of Berea were more open-minded than those in Thessalonica and they listened eagerly to Paul's message. They searched the scriptures day after day to see if Paul and Silas were teaching the truth. As a result, many Jews believed as did many of the prominent Greek women and men. So you're going to see that again, um, Paul and Silas, you know, who were apostles, they were, again, teachers of the word of God. They were teachers. They were teachers. They were teachers. Apostles are going to be teachers. Teachers, you know, in the scriptures uh, has been attached to the apostolic gift and the pastoral gift. You're going to see that as I'm going to talk about that next. So uh, the teachers are not, they're not a a, um, a solo band gift. It's not, not in the script because you have to even think about this. To be a teacher, now you can operate as a teacher under a pastor. Like, you know, I do, I do want to emphasize that as well, you know, because I do want to do, make sure I, I don't, I don't um, bring uh, a confusion there. 
uh, teachers can work with pastors, meaning like a pastor in a church, he's going to have a big body of work to do. So te teachers will work under him, you know. So then again, you can operate as a teacher in that sense, you know, uh, just to be to be fair there. You can actually operate as a teacher in a solo band way if you're in a local setting, you know. But I'm talking about if you're going to be a traveling teacher uh, in scripture, the traveling teachers were in the New Testament primarily, that was attached with the apostles and the evangelists and the pastors. They were teachers locally because a pastor is not one that is going to be, you know, on the move because he has been given a body of people to 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 disciple, which means he, a pastor is stationary is a stationary gift. So those who work as teachers, you know, a solo like just in a solo gift that being just a teacher in a local setting, that can be possible because like I said, in a pastor, in, in a church, a local church, that is a mega church, a pastor, you know, he's teaching, but you know, they might have small groups that the, t the pastor has entrusted people that he himself has discipled, you know, to teach. Because I want to emphasize, sometimes you see churches, they'll do this thing where it's a mega church and then they do, they do, they do, um, people can volunteer to become teachers. But the problem I have with that you know, it, it doesn't align with scripture in this sense to me is sometimes it's like you volunteer yourself. The pastor, didn't, he didn't disciple you. He doesn't know what doctrine you're teaching. Now, granted, they might make you take some type of survey or quiz. And then if you pass based on the survey or quiz, they, they basically say you're qualified to become, you know, a leader or of an e-group or a teaching or teaching a, a little session of a group. But the problem is I can lie, you know, and because I can say, okay, I know what they, they want me to say here and I can check off all these boxes. And based on that test, you say he qualifies to teach. But no, if you're going to teach under a pastor in a local church, you have to have been discipled by that pastor. Like, for example, Jesus discipled the 12 himself, and then he put them in charge of the ministry after he left. Therefore, he discipled the teachers that were going to now teach, what that means is if teachers are going to be a solo band gift in a local church setting, they would have to have been um, discipled by their pastor. If not, then to me, I think that's dangerous because you may have people who are teaching in these small groups, something that is contrary to what you, the pastor is teaching. But typically the teaching gift is going to be a, a gift that is attached to the pastor and the apostle and uh, sometimes even the evangelist. And I'm going to show you now as I've already showed you with the, the, the apostle, they were teachers. Paul, he traveled, you know, uh, Peter, he traveled, you know, the other apostles, they, they were not stationary men. And like I said, they, they were on the move. And when they went places, they, they taught the word of God. Uh, Paul discipled, you know, um, people where he went as well as Peter. And, um, you're going to see that again, teachers are connected to the apostolic gift. Now, to show you teachers being attached to the pastoral gift, uh, we're going to go to start with Jesus as well. Like I said, he's, he was a pastor. He had the 12. And if you read the Beatitudes, sometimes people miss this. And the Beatitudes, you know, because even I've missed that early on. I didn't catch that, which was that sometimes we read the Beatitudes as if there was a crowd of people around Jesus. And he was teaching to the to, to a large crowd, but that's not what the Bible says. If you go to Matthew chapter five, primarily, uh, we're going to read verses one and verses two. Matthew chapter five, verses one and two. That reads. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain. And when he was seated, his disciples came to him. So you got to keep the context. Jesus sees a crowd of people gathering. So then what does he do? He goes up on a mountain, on the mountainside, and then he sits down. But who gathers around him? It doesn't say it's the crowd that gathers around him. It says his disciples gathered around him. And then he began to teach them. Who's them? his disciples that just gathered around him. So sometimes, you know, um, I know I've made that mistake and maybe you have as well. Maybe you haven't, maybe it was just me, who knows? But, you know, I remember originally I thought it was a crowd of people that he was teaching, but it wasn't a crowd of people. He left the crowd and went on a mountainside and then his disciples came to him and sat up and gathered around him and he taught them being his disciples. Um, and, and yes, so he began to teach the disciples. And what's my point in saying that Jesus is in the role of pastor because his disciples are what? Those are his sheep. The disciples are his sheep. 
you know, and he's their shepherd. And then it says that he began to teach them. So what's my point? Pastors are teachers. You know, Jesus was a pastor and he taught his disciples. He often taught his disciples. He often taught his disciples, often taught his disciples. It's like when you think about a dad and a mom, you know, if you're a dad and a mom, look at that as you're a pastor. Who's your sheep? Your children are your sheep. And a, a, a good dad, a good mother, you're always teaching your children. So Jesus in the role of a pastor, he was always teaching his disciples. That's why Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, and the rest of the crew, they were able to have the understanding they had because they're pastors being Jesus was constantly teaching them for the three years that he was with them. So we see that with Jesus. I always start with Jesus because Jesus was a pastor. He was a, man, a manifestation of all five gifts. So we see him in the role of pastor. He was a teacher as well. But now if you go to 1 Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 to 2, you're going to see that one of the qualifications to be a pastor, you have to be able to teach. That's one of the qualifications to even be a pastor. 1 Timothy chapter 3, it says, this is a trustworthy saying. If someone aspires to be an elder, he, decide, he desires an honorable position or a bishop. So an elder or a bishop must be a man whose life is above reproach. He must be faithful to his wife. He must exercise, exercise self-control, live wisely, and have a good reputation. He must enjoy having guests in his home, and he must be able to teach. He must be able to teach. So a true bishop or a pastor, however you want to word it, they must be able to teach because if you are going to be the person that is an example, which is what a bishop is, which is what a pastor is, is they are example setters. The reality is if you're going to set an example, it's not only going to be about how you, how you live, but it's going to be how what you say. The words that come out of your mouth must be, you know, uh, something that is edifying to those who are listening, those who are following you. So pastors are going to also be teachers, you know, because there are people that God has put front, uh, in the front row, the front center or center stage to be the example to the people that God has entrusted to their care. So apostles, operators, teachers, as well as pastors. And like I said, to teachers or whatever, to get back and, you know, to the foundation of what this teaching said, teachers are interpreters of the word of God. Why are pastors also teachers? Because God, you know, sends new congregants to the pastor. Peter was a new congregant. John and James were new congregants when they were sitting at the feet of Jesus. Remember, Matthew was a tax collector and Jesus says, follow me. And he became a disciple of Jesus. You see, he was a new convert. So now the new convert needs someone to give them understanding. And that's exactly what Jesus did as pastor. He gave these guys understanding. So the same thing, a pastor is supposed to be someone who pastors new congregants, people who have just given their life to Christ. Again, the original apostles operated in a pastoral way temporarily with the first church. That's why when these 3,000 believers gave their life to Christ. They did what next? They devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine, to their teaching. Why? Because they're new to this, which means they're going to need someone to instruct them on how does this work? What does this mean? What does that mean? And so the reality is pastors as well as apostles operate as teachers because the pastor and the apostles, you know, apostles primarily, like I said, they set the foundation to begin with. And so they're going to interpret the word of God as we see the original apostles did. They set the foundation. What was the foundation? The foundation was their teachings because Jesus told you in Matthew chapter 7 verses 24 to 28, he said, those who listen to my teaching and follow it are wise. Like the one who builds a house on a solid rock. So the foundation has to be the teaching. So when you read Ephesians, I believe it's chapter two or chapter one. I want to fact check it. When it talks about how the uh, the apostles are the, they, they are the foundation setters, you know, of the church. You know, what foundation did they lay? Did they take bricks and build a foundation? No, that's a spiritual thing that Paul is talking about. The foundation they laid was the teaching of Jesus Christ. That is Acts chapter, I mean, Ephesians chapter two, starting at verses. Uh, 20. It says, together we are his house built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets and the cornerstone of the cornerstone is Jesus Christ himself. So when it says that we are his house, speaking of the church, built on the foundation of the apostles, what is the foundation that the apostles laid? It is the teaching of Jesus Christ. So the teachers are those who interpret the word of God. The apostles interpreted the word of God because Jesus taught them. And then the Holy Spirit came and instructed them furthermore and reminded them of the things Jesus had already taught them. And then like Matthew 28, verse 16 to 20, they did what Jesus told them to do. They went and gave people the understanding of the teachings that Jesus gave them them. So apostles are teachers, pastors are teachers. Why? Because pastors as well, 
they are entrusted, you know, to uh, be an example and to lead a flock of sheep being people. And in, in, in doing so, they have to be able to teach this flock. Like I said, the example is dad and mom, dad and mom, you know, they have sheep, which are their children, and they are entrusted by God to teach them because in the Proverbs, it tells the parent to teach, to train up your child, which is a, another way of saying teach your child, you know, the way that they should go that when they get older, they won't depart from it. So you see the parent who represents pastor, you know, they are entrusted by God to teach their children the right way. So pastors, as well as apostles, they are teachers. And what is their role as a teacher? It's to interpret the word of God, you know, uh, so that those who are new to this or those who have been here and had bad leadership can have understanding that they too may be able to mature, that one day God may entrust them, you know, to be teachers to someone else. And that is the role of a teacher. The role of a teacher in the body is that is 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 a, is the one who, again, understands and interprets the word of God. Because I said to you again that the word of God is spirit and truth. It's spirit and life. I mean, as Jesus said, and so it must be interpreted, you know, in order for people to have understanding of it. You know, not everybody can just pick up a Bible, start reading it and understand it. You know, if you go to a non-believer right now, give them a Bible, tell them to read this, read that, and then tell them to explain it. They're going to tell you, I don't understand it. And that's my point. If you get to the person who just gave their life to Jesus yesterday, again, same thing. Give them a Bible right now and tell them to read this and then tell them, explain it. They're going to tell you, I can't. You know, just like when you see Philip. And now I'm going to go to my third point of how evangelists also, they are primarily preachers of the gospel, but they must still know how to teach. Again, evangelists may not primarily operate as teachers because the call on their life does not ask them to do that. The call on their life is to go and preach to places and to people. I mean, in places to people who have not yet heard the gospel message of Jesus Christ. So they're primarily focused on just preaching the gospel, but they must be able to teach as well, because like we're going to see a scenario with Philip in, in Acts chapter 8, who was an evangelist. We're going to see that he gets in a scenario where the Holy Spirit sends him down, you know, to Gaza, where he's going to, you know, have an encounter with a eunuch. And the eunuch is going to be reading a, a passage of scripture um, from the book of Isaiah that he doesn't understand. So what's my point? The, the, the eunuch is reading from the scripture, a passage that he does not understand. And so when Philip shows up, the, because the Holy Spirit's going to lead him down this way to where the eunuch was, the eunuch's going to ask Philip to come up into the carriage and he's going to begin to you know read this thing to Philip, this piece of scripture. And Philip, he asked Philip, you know, Philip asked him, this is Acts of the 8 verses 30. So, and I'm giving you context again, he, he Philip was led to the, by the Holy Spirit down to this place called Gaza. He runs into a eunuch. The eunuch tells Philip to come into this carrier that he was in. And then he's reading from the book of, of the prophet Isaiah. And then uh, the Holy Spirit tells Philip, I mean, Philip asked the man, as he hears the man reading from this book, of Isaiah, Philip asked him, do you understand what you are reading? And what is one of the meanings of a teacher? It's to understand. You see that? So Philip asked him, do you understand what you are reading? The man says what? Notice this. This man in verse 31 says to Philip, how can I unless someone instructs me? What was one, What is the Greek meaning of the word teacher? It's didaskalos, which means what? Instructor. <laughs> and so now he tells Philip, how can I understand what I'm reading unless someone instructs or a.k.a. teaches me? And then he urged Philip to come up into the carriage and sit with him. The passage of scripture he had been reading was this. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. He was humiliated and received no justice. Who can speak of the set? Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, "Tell me, was the prophet talking about himself or someone else?" So, beginning with this same scripture, Philip gave him. Philip told him the good news about Jesus. As they rode along, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, "Look, there's some water. Why can't I be baptized?" He ordered the carriage to stop, and they went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch never saw him again, but went on his way rejoicing. And we know that Philip was a, a, an evangelist because uh, later on in the book of Acts, um, the Bible is going to tell us that he was an evangelist. And Acts chapter 21 um, is going to tell us that Philip is an evangelist in Acts chapter 21 verses 8. 
Paul had went to his house, actually. It says the next day we went on to Caesarea and stayed at the home of Philip, the evangelist, one of the seven men who had been chosen to distribute food. So we know he was an evangelist. And now as an evangelist, we saw that he gave the eunuch understanding or he instructed him or he taught him, you know, uh, the scripture that he was reading, which goes to tell us what the evangelists also operate as teachers, but not primarily because that scenario is not, it's a rare case, meaning nine times out of 10, the evangelist is not here to really teach, you know, because sometimes you're going to see that evangelists do teach. I'm trying to say this, but not, you know, get you confused. Do evangelists teach? Yes, they do teach, but that's not what they do primarily is what I'm trying to get you to understand. They, they primarily preach, secondarily, they, they teach. The reason they primarily preach is because their main objective is to preach this message of Jesus that you haven't heard. That's why they focus with the non-believer with that message. But the teachers are those who are going to disciple. Evangelists don't necessarily disciple because it literally just told you there if you read that, if you listen to what I said correct um, 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 in completion, after Philip baptized him, the Holy Spirit snatched him away and he never saw the guy again. So when you think about a teacher in, in, in the context that we're talking about it in the body of Christ, these are people who disciple but not on um, new believers, new congregants. So evangelists are not going to operate as teachers in that way because they're not here to disciple. Evangelists do not disciple. Evangelists preach. They give you the gospel message of Jesus Christ and they're on their way to the next person who needs to hear the gospel message of Jesus Christ, but they have to know how to teach just in case they find themselves in a scenario like Philip did. But primarily they will not be teachers in the body of Christ, but they must know how to teach. Hope that makes sense to you. But primarily, the people who operate as teachers in the body of Christ are going to be apostles because they're going to disciple and pastors are going to disciple. So primarily, the teaching gift is going to be associated with the apostle and the pastor in the body of Christ. Why did I not associate the teaching gift with the prophet in, the, in, in, in this teaching is because, again, a prophet's role in the body of Christ is to simply speak what the Lord is saying, to simply reveal what God has revealed to them about future events. That is the role of the prophet. The prophet is not necessarily here to teach. Again, just like the evangelist, does that mean a prophet can't teach? That's not what I'm saying. A prophet can teach, but the teaching role, the, the, the person who operates as a teacher in the body of Christ is primarily going to be people, the, the gift that is discipling people. The gift that disciples people in the body of Christ in the New Testament is going to be the apostle and the pastor. Those are the discipling gifts, the apostle and the, the pastor, not the prophet. The prophet doesn't disciple. The, the evangelist doesn't disciple. So the teaching gift is going to be more so affiliated with the apostle and the pastor because apostles, they lay foundations and pastors, they shepherd a flock of people. So those two roles or gifts in the, in the body of Christ are going to be what the teacher, the teaching gift will be connected to those two gifts. So in conclusion, um, this is what the teacher is. The teacher is interpreters of the word of God, but it's going to start with the apostle because like I said, they are the ones who set the foundation. They set the structure, you know, of, of the church, wherever God plants church. You know, I've said this again, um, when you talk about the five fold ministry and how it works together, you know, the reality is, um, these gifts work together to establish kingdom in the location that God wants kingdom to be established. And, and in, in this case, the kingdom of God is supposed to infiltrate every part of the earth, every part of the earth. And that's the whole point. It's supposed to replicate. You know, uh, when I've, I've given the example of a Walmart, a Walmart has, Walmart has replicated itself in every part of the United States. That's why you can go to every single state in America and you'll find at least one Walmart. I'm pretty sure you'll find multiple in every state, but you're going to find at least, at the minimum, one Walmart in every state. So what Walmart has done is they have replicated Walmart in every part of America. And when you go to Walmart in different parts of America, when you walk into that Walmart, it is the same Walmart. You're not seeing a different Walmart. You walk in. Granted, this month, this one might be a little smaller. That one's a little bigger. But the reality is it's the same Walmart. It's the same Walmart. Same thing with McDonald's. They've replicated themselves. If you go to every single state in America, you're going to find at least one McDonald's. And when you walk into that McDonald's and you look at the menu, you, you've never been to a McDonald's whose menu has Chinese food. <laughs> you've never been to a McDonald's, you know, whose menu is selling barbecue ribs. You're, you're not going to find that. Why? Because the, 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 the system or the menu, it's the same because the system is 
is the same. What I'm saying to you is church is the body of Christ coming together. That's what makes church. So when you think about what is church look like, it's the different parts of the body or the different gifts in the body doing this. They're in sync. They're unison. But when they're like this, they're spread apart or they're like one here, one here, one here. That's not kingdom. That's not church because Jesus preached the unity. In John 17, he he, pre, he prayed to God that the church, you know, would be one as he and God were one. You know, so when there's the vision in the body of Christ, you know, that's not kingdom. That's not church because God's body, Christ's body is not divided. It's united. And so what is my point? When you talk about apostle, you talk about prophet, you talk about evangelist, pastor, and teacher, these gifts coming together is what allows the world to see what church looks like. Because a church is supposed to manifest Christ, you know, in, its, in his fullness. And like I said, Jesus was sent out with power. Jesus preached. Jesus taught. Jesus loved. Jesus was an example. He encouraged. He gave himself. He emptied himself. So the reality is, and I know this right now, I'm giving you more than the teacher. I'm kind of going outside of that right now. But I'm just saying all that so to make it make sense that the five gifts that God gave you know, they are supposed to work together in harmony. And that is what will allow people to, to see what church actually looks like. Um, this is the teaching on the, the teacher, who they are. Like I said to you, primarily teachers are those who disciple. And that gift is going to be attached to the apostle and the pastor primarily. And evangelists and prophets, they know how to teach, but they're not going to operate primarily as teachers because they don't necessarily disciple because their gift is not to ask them to disciple. The prophets give, ask them to go and give the message of God, you know, uh, where God is asking them to give it. And the evangelists there are supposed to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to the lost. So those two gifts don't act, don't, they don't primarily disciple, but apostles and pastors do. So the teaching gift is connected to them. I said to you, yes, someone can operate as a teacher, you know, in, 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 just as a teacher, but that's if they're in a local church setting, like I said, operating under a pastor who has discipled them. But primarily the teacher will be um, the apostle and the, the pastor. That's typically who would be teachers in the body of Christ. Uh, and you can fact check it. I gave you all these verses that you can see for yourself. Um, I quoted these verses. I didn't make anything up. Um, and I hope this video gave you understanding of who the teacher is in the body of Christ. Typically, it's going to be the apostle and the pastor. These days, typically, we see the teacher as the pastor, and you don't really see teachers as apostles because there's a false teaching, which I want to uh, I want to condemn that teaching right now while I have the chance to. There's a teaching that there are no more apostles, that uh, they say that apostles, they have ceased. You know, you'll find many theologians, you know, uh, saying things of that nature, and they have no idea what they're talking about. The reason I say that is because if you say that the apostle has ceased, then there's the, the pastoral gift has ceased, and the evangelist gift has ceased, and the prophet has ceased. You can't pick the ones that ceased and the ones that you like or the ones that benefit you that haven't ceased. No, none of the gifts have ceased because the last time I checked, Jesus has not returned yet. The last time I checked, there is not unity in the body. The last time I checked, you know, uh, the same way you, you replicate a Walmart, it's the same Walmart. What does that mean? When you talk about planting churches, when you talk about, you know, building kingdom in an area that were, where kingdom is non-existent, that starts with the apostle. It, it, you know, church, or when you talk about kingdom church, however you want to say that, being established in a city, in a region, it's supposed to start with the apostle because if you read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28, it literally says first are apostles, which means whenever kingdom is going to be established anywhere, it's going to start with the apostles. So um, like I said, the teaching that apostles don't exist, it's a false teaching. Apostles definitely still exist. And like I said, they operate as teachers first because whenever kingdom is going to be established and to make that make sense in a practical way, I want to give you something to think about. Whenever you're going to build a new Walmart, since we're, you're using Walmart as an example, whenever you're going to build a new Walmart in a different state, who is the one who always, not sometimes, who is the one who always builds the foundation of the building? The construction workers. Think about what I've just said. No matter where you're going to build this Walmart, whether it was in Illinois, whether it was in Georgia, Florida, New York, Massachusetts, California, Texas, it doesn't matter what state. Whenever there's going to be a Walmart built, 
it's always the same group of guys who builds it and they're called construction workers. You're never going to have a group of doctors building a Walmart. You're never going to have a group of truck drivers building a Walmart. You're never going to have a group of lawyers building a Walmart. So what that means is whenever kingdom is going to be established somewhere that kingdom is non-existent, it's always going to start <laughs> with the apostle. So if you tell me that kingdom has infiltrated every part of the world, then at that point, Jesus would have returned. And this is what I'm trying to get you to understand. There are places right now in this world that don't even know about Jesus. There are places right now in America that are in spiritual darkness. They need the kingdom of God to show up there. They need the church to be established there. And if that is to happen, if the church is supposed to be established in a region, in a city, in a state, on a street, on a block where there is no church, there is no kingdom there, it'll always start with the apostle. Kingdom starts with the apostle. Bringing kingdom starts with the apostles. They're first in rank for that reason in the body of Christ because they are the ones who God uses to go in first to lay down the foundation. And so I say all that just to simply denounce the teaching that there are no more apostles because what I've taught to you today is that the teacher in the role of the body of Christ is linked to the apostle as well as the pastor. Um, but it starts with the apostle. That's the teaching of who the teacher is in the body of Christ. I hope, as always, this video was edifying. And uh, before I leave, I do want to say this last little nugget. Um, where do teachers teach? Teachers, like I said, because it is connected with the apostle and the pastor, I do want to say that they primarily teach either in homes or they teach in the synagogue, which today we know as a local church is what they call it or a temple. That's typically where you're going to see the apostle and the pastors teaching people is either in homes or in the church or in the, like I said, synagogue, temple, however you say that. Um, um, and another thing I want to talk about is all believers are supposed to mature to a place where they understand and can teach if it's needed. Because in the book of Hebrew, chapter 5, verse 11, the writer of Hebrews was condemning these people because he was saying that they had been believers for so long, but yet they, they still needed to be taught the basics. But he was the, the writer is saying that you should have been able to be teaching people by now. So I say that to simply say what? Like the evangelist, like the prophet, you know, all believers, all believers who have, have maturity in the body, all believers who have been discipled, they have to have... The, ability to teach need be you know just because lebron james is not a center that doesn't mean he shouldn't know how to play center just like if you study basketball and i know i'm kind of getting i'm using this as a practical example for those of you who don't know there was a year where i believe it was kareem abdul-jabbar who was hurt and so magic johnson had to play center he had to play center and he won the championship with the Lakers that year as a starting center, but he's the primary, he's primarily a point guard. My point is just because you're not the center doesn't mean you should be ignorant to the job of a center because we might need you to be a center. Like at, you know, a job, you might not be a cashier. I remember when I worked at Toys R Us, I was not primarily a cashier at some point. I remember at some point I was back of house, but they told me sometimes it can get so busy during the season that we might need people from different branches in, 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 the, in the business to come to the front as cashiers. So even if you're a stock shelf person, even if you're somebody who unloads the truck, if they call on the call com, we need you know all the employees to come to the front as cashiers, then we all would have to go to the front and now be cashiers. Even though we're not primarily cashiers, we still have to know how to be a cashier. And it's the same thing. All believe are supposed to mature to a place where they have understanding of the scriptures like Philip that if they're in a situation where someone needs understanding they can give it to them that doesn't necessarily mean you are a teacher that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be used by God primarily to disciple people but you still need to be able to teach and just wanted to throw that nugget in there because I don't want you to think well I'm not an apostle I'm not a pastor so screw it I don't need to know how to teach no you still need to know how to teach because you might find yourself in a position one day where someone has a biblical question and you can answer it because you have maturity and understanding of the word and we have too many Christians who have been in church for five years ten years and they don't know a lick of scripture and like I said is I don't want to leave that point out because you might say well Jr. said based on his teaching that the teachers are typically apostles and pastors and I don't have that call in my life so screw it I don't need no you still need to know how to teach the same with LeBron still needs to know how to be able to play shooting guard small forward center and power forward you know Magic Johnson has to know how to play center as well because something can happen where we might need that like Philip, you're an evangelist. We know you're supposed to just be preaching. But in this case, this guy needs understanding of that, that scripture he's reading in Isaiah. Do you know how to help him? Can you interpret that? Can you teach him? And if you can't, 
Philip's opportunity to be able to even to even be able to give that guy the gospel came through him being able to interpret that scripture for that guy. So you have to still all believers need to know how to teach. All believers are supposed to mature to a place of understanding of the scriptures. And if it's in God's will for you to operate as a teacher, you know, in terms of discipling and primarily now functioning in that gift, because like I said, if you read Acts chapter six, verse one to four, the apostles, they primarily functioned as teachers when they were operating in that, the, the, in that teaching gift because they were discipling. So if God may elevate you to that place, but even if he doesn't, that doesn't mean be ignorant to the scriptures, still be discipled by your pastor or by the apostle, if you're, you know, you're gifted, you, you're, you're, you're grace to be able to have an apostle in your life, sit at their feet, be discipled, grow an understanding of your scriptures. And, and even if you're not, you know, with the apostle or the pastor, still open the scriptures for yourself, you know, every now and then, you know, and, and, and ask God to give you understanding because you too have the Holy Spirit, which means, you know, the Holy Spirit, if you spend enough time can actually open your eyes because the reality is, you know, I play music and I've never you know, went to school to play music. But the reality is I've locked myself in this room and, and, and I just play. And just through playing enough, you know, you start to pick things up as you go. So I believe that can happen as well. You know, if you have the Holy Spirit, if you really are serious about learning and maybe you don't have a pastor, a healthy pastor at your feet, pray and ask God to send a man or a, of God in your life that can lead you in understanding or just hone in and, and, and read every day. And the Holy Spirit can give you understanding because it is important that all believers mature and have understanding and are able to teach need be. But this is who the teachers are in the body of Christ. This is what they do. They interpret the word of God. They give understanding to those who need it, to the new converts and to those who have been in the church for a long time but had were under bad leadership. So they were never discipled. That's the, the teacher's job to give them understanding of the word of God, uh, indoctrinate them with the truth of God's word. And I hope this makes sense. I hope this teaching was edifying for somebody. And this wraps up the fivefold ministry teaching. The next video I will do, I'm now going to connect the five um, gifts together to show you how they work in unison or in harmony. And then we will move on to our next teaching from there. So may God bless you.